I seek to sense ultimate existence, fundamental ground of all being. I seek to touch ultimate essence, the foundations of the world and all things. Existence is absolute presence. Essence is deepest composition. How did the world come about? Of what is it made? Is there a God or anything like God? What are we humans in the great scheme of things? I've been obsessed with these kinds of ultimate questions. This is metaphysics. For decades, I've pursued philosophical arguments and explanations about ultimate existence and essence, but I did so largely from a Western perspective. Physics and cosmology combined with analytic philosophy. Recently, I've come to realize that Eastern traditions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Chinese philosophies of Taoism and Confucianism, have other ways to see existence and to discern essence, other ways beyond seeing and discerning. In Eastern traditions, what are ultimate existence and essence? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. Diverse belief systems fascinate me. I've always tried to respect views that differ from my own, explore what I might learn about human capacity, longing, imagination, and possibly about reality. I've needed to focus on Eastern traditions, especially on their philosophical foundations. I'm aware of my biases. On the one hand, a Judeo-Christian worldview. On the other, a rational or analytic approach to all religious traditions. For Eastern traditions, I try to put both biases aside, approach each from its own perspective. I'll start with the most ancient metaphysical system, the Vedas, the sacred scriptures of Hinduism, which convey profound insights about existence and essence. I speak with a Hindu monk of the Advaita Vedanta school and the Ramakrishna order, the head of the Vedanta Society of New York, Swami Sarvapriyananda. Swami, in Hindu philosophy, what are some of the core metaphysical or ontological categories that we deal with that are important? Ontology asks the question, what is real? And just like everything else in Hinduism, there is a whole range of answers. One would be the Nyaya Vaisheshika pluralism. The second one would be the Sankhya Yoga dualism. And the third example would be the Advaita Vedanta non-dualism. Ultimately, there are, according to one view, seven ultimate realities. Uh, there are substances, things. There are qualities, these substances have qualities. There are actions, there are relationships, there are universals. Mm. There's something called an absence also. These are non-reducibles. Right. Then comes the Sankhya Yoga schools. They say, no, all of that, you know, you can put all of it into a material nature. They call it Prakriti. And the other reality which cannot be reduced to material nature is you, consciousness. That's a pure dualism. That's a pure dualism. Consciousness, both are real. Yeah. They are parallel and they interact. So consciousness, nature. Purusha and Prakriti in Sanskrit. That's the Sankhya Yoga dualism. Then in another example would be the Advaita Vedanta, which is a radical non-dualism. There we say that all of what you're speaking about is an appearance. And the reality is one existence, consciousness, bliss. Uh, you can just call it one existence, one being. And all the other st stuff, you know, existing things like substances, qualities, actions, relationships, universals, or even all of material nature is an appearance in this one being. Uh, so Advaita Vedanta brings in two levels of ontological truth. The absolute reality, which is the non-dual Brahman, which is pure being, pure awareness, pure bliss. And the level of the Vyavaharika, the transactional world, which is like a movie playing on the movie screen. Movie screen being Brahman and the movie being this world. And all your substance and relationship and universals can have, they have their place in the movie, but it's strictly a movie. If you have a non-dualistic approach, is causation even an issue? Again, yes and no. 
Causality is very important in Indian philosophy. Buddhists, Jains, and various schools of Hinduism, they sort of turns on the question of causality. And they had multiple theories of causality. There were emergence theories called Arambhavada. There is the manifestation theory. You know, for example, genes express potential qualities. Yeah. So a seed sprouts into a tree. But they are not two different things because it was potentially there in the seed. And that is called Satkaryavada. Uh, the pre-existence of the effect in the cause. <laughs> what the Advait in the non-dualist says is, because this entire the universe is an appearance in one uh, spiritual reality, yeah. like Brahman, there is actually no causal link between the ultimate reality and this universe. Causality itself is part of the story. Why this universe exists is because the answer is Maya. The ground is Brahman, the reality is Brahman. Um, so why Brahman looks like this universe? First of all, it did not become the universe. Brahman is the ultimate reality, is not a creator god. A creator god is very much part of the movie, part of the fiction. Uh, the god, the universe God created, and sentient beings God rules over is part of the story. And the, the god in that case is is, is secondary or derived from the ultimate Brahman. Yeah, classical Advaita Vedanta would say that. But remember, since you are that ultimate Brahman, you the individual being, uh, you are that. So God is also saved because God is also that ultimate reality. God is not a fiction. Right, okay. Uh, so what is the causal link between that ult ultimate reality and this universe? No causal link. You might ask, yeah, I understand it appears. It's not real, it's like a movie. But why does the movie, you can still ask why. And the answer is, is very interesting. It says you cannot ask why, because even why is part of the story. Causality is also part of the story. Maya is defined as time, space, causation. Mm. It's as wrong as asking what was there before time. But when you ask before time, you already accepted time. If you ask why Maya, why the universe, you have already accepted causality. But the reality is that the ultimate reality is uh, not causally linked with the universe. What about abstract objects like numbers or logic? Uh, universals, that's a big thing in Indian philosophy, but there you have to go to the school of logic, the Nyaya. Uh, they specialized in this kind of stuff. They are realists. Everything exists. Substances exist, qualities exist, universals exist, they are real. Just like platonic reals, they are there, they are out there. Um, there are class universals, there are a whole range of universals. Against them, the Buddhists attack them and said, reality is pure particulars. Things emerge in a flash and disappear, yeah. and it's, they create an illusion. And Advaita Vedanta was not really a player in this game. Their answer is predictable. It's part of the movie. Mm. The ultimate reality, Brahman, uh, is not a universal. That's a big debate. You know, uh, things exist. So existence is the ultimate universal. Is that what you non dualists are talking about, the ultimate universal Brahman? No. Uh, Universals are also dependent on particulars which exist. Can you ask why does Brahman exist? No, because why comes after Brahman? So one way of understanding this would be it's a necessary existence. Everything exists because of Brahman. And non-existence is impossible and never was possible. Never was possible. Yeah. Locally it's possible. Vedanta metaphysics is sophisticated and profound. The abstract specificity of Brahman as pure being, pure awareness, pure bliss, is breathtaking. The various Hindu schools, though offering contrasting views, seem coherent, each in its own context. To discern existence in essence, I like that ultimate test question of non-reducibility. Whatever is non-reducible is, by definition, fundamental. That's why I wonder about God in Hinduism. The outside assumption is polytheism, a multitude of gods. What about God from the inside? Moreover, what is the Vedic relationship between God and the world? I ask another monk from the same school in the same order, who seeks God by integrating Western philosophy with Vedanta, Swami Medananda. The vast majority of Vedanta schools are devotional in nature and they believe in an ultimate personal God. And they believe that this world is also intimately related to that personal God. And they bring in two different forms of causality, 
to explain the relationship between the personal God in this world and the, and the world's ontological status. So one kind of causality is instrumental causation. So the idea is that God is the instrumental cause of this world in the same way that a potter, for instance, is the instrumental cause of a clay pot that the potter makes. But there's another kind of causality, which is material cause, where the material cause of the clay pot is not the potter, but the clay itself, which is shaped into these different pots. And so according to many devotional schools of Vedanta, God, the personal God, is both the instrumental cause of this world and the material cause of this world. But one school of Vedanta, which is also devotional, it's Madhva's school of dualistic Vedanta, He's worried about the problem of evil. He's so worried about it. He says, if we actually make God the material cause of this world, then God gets infected with the evil that we find in this world. And so he says, no, God is the instrumental cause of this world, but not the material cause. But other traditions are bolder, and they, and they bite the bullet, and they say that, no, but God is also the material cause of this world, which is admittedly full of both good and evil, but we have other ways of responding to the problem of evil. The way most... Hindu schools see it is that God continually sustains this world and that the world has no independent existence apart from God. That Vedanta schools are devotional means they believe in a personal God. And this Hindu God is not only the instrumental cause of the world, meaning that God caused the world to come into existence, but also the material cause, meaning that God is the essence of which the world is composed. God, then, would be the reason for existence and the substance of its essence. Whether it's pure existence alone or pure existence and a personal God remains a long-standing tension in Hindu philosophy. How does Buddhism, Hinduism's legendary philosophical rival, perceive existence and essence? I ask a professor of philosophy, logic, and Buddhist studies who specializes in Buddhist metaphysics, Jay Garfield. Whenever we say that something's empty, we have to ask the question, empty of what? A room can be empty of elephants, but not empty of people. Empty of people, but not empty of furniture. Empty of furniture, but not empty of air, and so forth. And so when we, when we talk about emptiness, we begin by identifying what we call in the Tibetan tradition, the object of negation, the thing that we're going to be empty of. In the Madhyamaka tradition, the tradition of Nagarjuna, the philosopher who lived in about the second century, that is intrinsic identity. Importantly, it is not existence. So when we say that things are empty, we say that they don't exist intrinsically. Instead, they exist in mutual dependence. He says, whatever is dependently originated, we explain to be emptiness. That, being a dependent designation, is the middle way. So he's saying the essence of Madhyamaka, the middle way, is to see that emptiness and dependent origination are the same thing. To say that something's dependently originated is not to say it's not real. Yeah. It's to say that its mode of reality is empty of anything that's intrinsic to it. Because it's dependent upon something else. Exactly, exactly. Now, that's the Madhyamaka conception. And the longer we think about it, the more profound it is. Because if you ask about emptiness itself, is that what's real? Then if we, we can just turn this around and say, no, emptiness is also empty. Because the emptiness of anything depends upon that thing and only comes into existence when that thing is there. It's a property of things. So if I had an apple and its redness, and I took away the apple, I take away the redness. But I also take away its emptiness. Mm -hmm. So emptiness is not a separate reality that stands behind a world of illusion. Rather, it's the analytical character of the things that appear to us as our conventionally existent, dependently arisen world. And that includes us. We're empty of having any essence as well. And that's the doctrine of selflessness of the person. Now, when we move to the Yogacara, the thing we perceive is empty of the properties we take it to have. We put those there. Secondly, it's empty of being independent. Because I don't just see an apple the way it is. I construct it. If a bee were seeing that apple, for instance, with its compound eyes and its vision in the infrared and ultraviolet, the apple's going to look way different to the bee. 
And now if you ask yourself, who gets it right? me or the bee, who sees the apple as it is, as opposed to how it appears, you realize that's a stupid question. There is no way the apple is. There are only ways it appears. That is, the apple is empty of there being any way that it is. And that's what the Buddha means when he's talking about emptiness with respect to production. And then when we ask, okay, all those cognitive and perceptual processes, do they have a kind of red shiny apple in them somewhere? The answer is no, they're empty of that. So the apple is also just ultimately empty, something that we simply construct in our experience. So the Yogacara idea looks at emptiness from the side of the subject. It provides us with a phenomenology or a psychology of emptiness where the Madhyamaka approach gives us emptiness from the side of the object doing a metaphysical analysis and they fit together just like that so if we want to understand what it is to see empty phenomena we can understand that we do that by interacting causally with them constructing a represented world and then mistaking the world we've constructed for a world that we just found mm. that's how to understand emptiness Emptiness is the foundation of Buddhist metaphysics. But emptiness does not mean non-existence. Emptiness means empty of intrinsic identity, a profound idea. I resonate with how Jay thinks analytically, coherently, cogently. As Buddhism spread eastward from the Indian subcontinent, it came to dominate much of Southeast Asia and Tibet, but not China where it met indigenous Chinese traditions. I meet a rare expert on Chinese metaphysics who studies the philosophical significance of recently excavated Chinese texts from around 300 BCE, Franklin Perkins. In Chinese metaphysics, there are certain basic assumptions that they all share together. So one is that everything comes out of one source. That's called the Tao, sometimes it's called Ooh, like not being indeterminate being, something like that, right? And out of that, you get individual things forming. So they end up seeing the whole world as one whole, that everything is interconnected, everything is changing, everything is related. We first start to see really metaphysical thinking in like the third century BC, probably in texts connected to the Tao Te Ching. And there it seems like they are driven partly just by metaphysical questions of what explains why we have the world that we have. But if you look at it, how they decide to explain it, one of the things they're trying to do is displace this kind of more anthropomorphic deity that, was, that had some influence at the time called Tian or Heaven. So they're trying to displace that with a more naturalistic account. And one of the things that they're trying to do is give an account that makes human beings actually not so special, right? So this earlier di divine force, you know, cared about human beings. And what they're trying to do is give an account in which that explains all things. All things arise equally from this source. They call it the Wam Wu, the tens of thousands of things. And then they're portraying human beings as one of that. I mean, a kind of rational judgment that in fact, human beings are not the center of the universe, right? You mentioned uh, two uh, Chinese words, uh, Tian and Wu. Uh, dig deeper on the metaphysical implications of both. So Tian is particularly difficult. So it's conventionally translated as heaven right, right. because this, the word means the sky. Right. right, And for them, the sky, they're looking at it as something dynamic. So it's not just the sky, it's the patterns of, you know, the, the stars, but the patterns of the sun and moon, the seasons. So early on, though, with this idea of Tien becomes very prominent. And it's clear that it, that it has preferences. So it, it supports the people. And this was part of how they rationalized the political change at the time. So the, the bad emperor lost power because he was bad. And the new person took power because they were good. And this is following the will of Tien. So Tien, what makes it difficult is it's always still identified with the patterns of nature. It's so it's not separate from nature. It's a, I don't know, kind of personification of nature. It's a kind of um, intentionality built into nature, but then systematized to be a good being. But to, to get more to the question of the metaphysics, because Tien is always, is like identified with the patterns of the world, no one ever argued that there is no Tien. If that makes no sense in Chinese philosophy to say that there is no Tian. What they would argue is, does it have any kind of awareness and what are its patterns? Do the patterns support goodness or not? So what happens is it gradually becomes less intention and is less good. 
and becomes more and more identical to just the patterns of nature. Oh, right. And in fact, it gets displaced a little bit in these metaphysical texts because they start to say, instead of talking about Tien, they talk about Tien Di, which is heaven and earth. So now Tien becomes like one pair that forms the whole of, of the natural world. Mm -hmm. Still is always one of the guiding ideas because there's always still some sense of reverence toward Tien, some sense of having to follow along with Tien, even if Tien's not conscious, even if it's not good. Did Tien start as if a quasi-god with a personality and then gradually uh, uh, mutate into uh, non-conscious nature? Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. And it's hard just to figure out where exactly the transition is. So how, how about Wu? So, the account of Wu was part of this displacing Tian. So the Tian kind of goes two ways. On the one hand, it keeps, stays prominent, but becomes more and more just like nature. And on the other hand, these Taoist texts are saying, well, Tian's not even the ultimate thing anyway. And so they're looking for a prior origin of that. And it seems like the first position that was put forward was that the ultimate is oneness, unity. It's just, it's Yi, the Chinese word for one. And then you have critiques of that that to say that, no, that's too concrete already. The, the ultimate has to be less concrete than that. And they start to use this phrase, Wu. And so Wu, it's, it's often translated as nothingness, but it doesn't mean really absolute nothingness. It really means like no definiteness. As sometimes I'll translate it as like no thingness instead of nothingness. Mm. But that's then taken as the, the kind of final answer to what's the ultimate cause of things. Mm -hmm. and, and more or less all Chinese philosophical systems end up taking that viewpoint. So it starts out as a Taoist viewpoint, but it becomes really the dominant Chinese cosmology, really. Frank dispels the simplistic notion that Chinese philosophy is devoid of metaphysics. It certainly differs from Western rationalism, focusing on the Tao, a kind of being or ultimate existent from which all comes. The Tao is simultaneously ultimate essence, such that all is interconnected and related. The Tao Te Ching, the foundational text of Taoism, has long intrigued me. Written around 400 BCE, the Tao Te Ching has only around 5,000 Chinese characters. Its pithy poetic style has catalyzed diverse contradictory interpretations. Its mysterious first verse is one of the most profound expressions of existence and essence. I explore its mystery with a scholar of ancient Chinese philosophy, director of Rutgers Center for Chinese Studies, Tao Jiang. Tao, I've always been struck by the first uh, a sentence of Tao Te Ching, uh, Tao Ke Tao, Fei Chang Tao. What's the metaphysical significance? Right, so the first sentence famously is a Tao that can be doubted or spoken of, uh, is not the eternal Tao, that's usually how it's translated. <laughs> I have a different uh, interpretation of the Tao Te Ching. It's usually understood as a kind of text that's kind of out of nowhere. That it's like, where does the text come from? The Tao Te Ching, you know, it portrays the, the world is being generated by the Tao. Uh, which, you know, the Tao generates heaven, uh, heaven generates the earth and, and, the, uh, and then gives rise to, to humans and therefore, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the entire world. But what's interesting is that the Tao Te Ching, uh, historically speaking, it sits at a very pivotal moment in uh, classical Chinese philosophy. It marks a sort of naturalist development. Prior to the Tao Te Ching, you have the, the, the analects. You have the conception of a heaven, which is kind of a quasi-theistic kind of entity um, that cares about the world, that's involved in the world, that's, you know, that wants, you know, the humans to flourish. But beginning with Tao Te Ching, we get the conception of heaven that doesn't care about humans anymore, right? It's, you know, so, so, so the heaven and earth are not humane. So then people have to deal with, okay, now what do we deal with heaven that doesn't care about us anymore? It's almost like the sort of the West is the death of God. Ultimate existence and essence in Eastern traditions coalesce around four profound principles. Transcendence, realms of existence beyond the physical world. Oneness, deep unity from primordial essence. Interconnectivity, all things are related. Ineffability, existence and essence allow no words. It's you. 
Compare the Tao and Taoism, the ultimate existent, the source of all, with Brahman and Hinduism, pure being, pure awareness, pure bliss, from which everything emerges. Compare the Wu in Taoism, beyond name and form, no thing, with the emptiness in Buddhism, empty of independent, intrinsic identity. How a personal god may or may not fit this picture is debatable. The argument is made that all ancient traditions, Eastern and Western, are pre-scientific, and therefore, while they may convey moral insights and social wisdom, they are not reliable sources to assess ultimate reality. I'd go for the argument, but for this. We can come to know all the laws of physics, but knowing why and how these laws happened at all, or are as they are, seems beyond the access of science. Could ultimate existence and essence offer an opening for Eastern and Western traditions to get closer to truth? For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.